Hello, welcome to the All or Not podcast. Our official sponsors are KR Couriers and Transport Limited. Hello, everyone. We're all good. Big thank you to everyone who likes, shares, comments, and subscribes to the All or Not podcast with myself, Billy Moore. A few things I learned over the years when I first got clean it was from the old timers in meetings. You know, and I was struggling in the very beginning. I mean, really, like holding on tight. And I went to this meeting in Chiang Mai, North Thailand. And there was an old guy from Chicago called Dale Ridgeway. I believe he sadly passed away now. He must have. He was, he was, he was in his seventies back then. You know, and this is going back about eighteen years ago. And I remember him saying to me, "Listen, Bill, right? You know, when you come to the end of your rope, you know what you need to do is try a knot in it and hang on." For five more minutes. And it'll pass. You know, a little pearls of wisdom like that, you know, encouraged me to keep moving forward, listening to them. And this is what I hope I can share with people out there who are struggling, especially with the fear and the anxiety and the addiction. You know, people talk about mental health and it's just, it's quite fashionable now to have mental health. You know, everyone's got it. And someone said to me, why don't you suffer with that after all the shit that you've been through? I went, because I've got no time for it. Life is too short. You know, unfortunately for me, if I speak to a doctor or someone who's in that profession about me yeah, being a little bit ski with, the first thing they want to do is give me drugs to come off drugs to change the way I feel. Right, because they want to keep me chained to the pharmacy, to the doctor's office, in that belief that I need something when it's on. So I've never took an antidepressants. I've took a lot of illegal substances, obviously, you know, everything from A to Z. Snorted it, drank it, mainlined it, everything. You know, there's nothing really much apart from these new drugs that I haven't took. You know, and these new drugs, the spice and the balloons and all them legal eyes, they're just there. Uh, they just take addiction to another level from what I've seen, you know, especially from my experience of going to prison, you know, a few years back and seeing these young kids on the spice getting bog brushes stuck up their asses with solar rolls set on fire and they're running across, the, you know, the suicide mesh for a bit of spice. People knocking at your cell door off the key with a little blue plate full of roasties trying to sell you them for a bit of spice. People on the landings touting the wearing tears, you know, for more drugs. You know, and then you've got the dealers at the end of the landing just roaring off them, laughing at everyone, you know, using them as a, a way to pass their time, just buzzing off people. You know, it was evil, it was horrible. And I, for the first time, in a very long time, went to prison and didn't use, went to prison clean. And what I observed was like, wow, it was unreal. And that's when I knuckled down and started to write this second book, Fighting For My Life. And I shared everything, you know, from actual factual on-site information. You know, how it made me feel, the anger, the, the way I reacted, other people's behaviour trying to stay clean in a cell with a pad mate who was off his fucking barney. He had all kinds plugged. They even put phones in the cell. Right? You know them fucking phones that the house phones, they put them in the cells. And he had this bird who was with at the time. And it was going a little it was a little bit rocky, a little bit of a shake up. You know, but he had I felt like I thought I was in love. Or I felt like I needed to be in love or and wanted and, you know, I just fucking liked them, stuff like that. And when I found her up one day and she's fucking, you know, saying everything that's telling me, you know, red flagging it, that it's over. You know, it was breaking my eyes and I put the phones on. I didn't know where to turn, the door was shut. You know, there's a saying in, in the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. Keep away from people, places and things. 
while he had that cell phone, he also had a little Zanko and a phone response. I took it into prison with me and it, you know, it was very rare he had to get it out because, you know, I didn't want to get nicked with it. Especially not with the sentences that they give out. So I got it out for my sponsor. And that's what he said to me, Billy, keep away from people, places and things. I thought, are you having a fucking laugh? You've obviously never been to prison. I'm in a cell with people, places and things. I can't keep away from them. The door's shut. I can't just get on the buzzer and ask the SO to let me out. You know, my pad mate, he's got the things on him. I'm in all kinds of feelings. And this is when I knew, you know, I truly knew that. You know, I had a strong recovery. No matter what I didn't want to use. I didn't want to use, but there was a part of me that would manipulate me. And I was a kid, right? Here's a story. There was a kid that used to score off on Breck Road. And he come in with a major parcel. And he wasn't a punter. He was just he was a dealer out there, but he had he, he got nicked on the way to, to Glasgow with with, with um, fucking warrants. But he had parcels galore up his ass, right? And he come in, he was going Billy, I'm going to do you a nice little thing here. I was all right, lads, that nice one. Part of me was going, say no, you don't want it. Fuck him off. Can you get us any shampoo, Bill, any munchies? Yeah, lad, yeah, because I was, I was on the cleaners. I had a mentor in role, so I could get out the pad. You know, and I was taking him a few bits because I liked him. He was okay. He was, he was always nice to me and, you know, teasing to me outside. And he was like that, like, I'll get that thing to you later. But it was like... It was pulling at me, that two dogs, fucking hell, you know, I want it, but I don't want it. And, you know, that desire to, to fucking change the way I feel, you know, was powerful. But also, if I played the tape forward, I knew where it'd take me. Fucking the drugs brought me to the prison. I was fucking in, you know, and I couldn't fucking wait for them to get moved off the wing because, you know, I was on A wing. It was an induction wing, you came in. You know, but it was a fucking bank holiday as well. So we was there for like four or five days. I was like, fucking doing me head in. You know, and, and I kept trying to, I kept them on side, but didn't say no. And he, I said, yeah, I'll get a laser, lad. You know, making sure it wasn't a rush of it. But you know what? I was so fucking relieved when he, when he went. And that was a big, massive test for me. You know, the one in the pad, my pad mate, he was another test. So yeah, you know, I found out that you could stay clean. You know, it didn't have to just depend on on meetings, you know, and people in recovery. I had something inside that said to me, you know what, you do not have to use. So that's when you hit rock bottom, when you want to get clean. If you've got that desire, you'll get fucking clean anyway, I'm telling you. You'll get clean and a fucking skip and stay clean. You know, it is what it is. But anyway... Just thought I'd share a little bit of my addiction, a little bit of my recovery and how I maintain you know, my clean time today. And I'm grateful one day at a time. Once again, thanks for listening and you take care.